Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, we're going to start the next uh, session. There's a... There's a slight change to the program uh, in that uh, one of our original speakers hasn't been able to make it and uh, I'm using a Mac and uh, so I'm going to go first and, and combine uh, a bit of what I was going to talk on which is image guided intervention and also a bit about MRI. So during this talk we're going to look at, first look at hip intervention both intraarticular and periarticular and how we use imaging for that obviously being a radiologist. Uh, I'm going to discuss a bit about MRI and, it's, and what my, my view of its use in groin pain and recurrent groin pain, but you've already had a lot of that this morning. And then finally, to also look at what we can do in terms of groin intervention from an image-guided therapy point of view. So if we look at the hip first, obviously we can perform diagnostic uh, uh, intervention for aspiration, injecting anaesthetic to see if uh, pain's ablated, also to perform MR arthrography, and then there's therapeutic we can perform for arthropathy, including FAI and labral abnormality. So what's the evidence? And there's a recurring theme throughout this talk. There isn't a lot. In fact, the whole session has been there's not a lot of uh, good evidence. Um, steroids have been used traditionally for intraarticular injection, and they're shown to be a good painkiller and most evidence shows they last at least six weeks um, but again at one year a lot of studies show no significant difference so really when you're speaking to a patient it's usually as a, as a painkiller you're less likely uh, to get a good effect if there's underlying arthropathy in the joint or they've got increased BMI which obviously isn't usually a problem in athletes. There's been a number of studies looking at anaesthetic as a predictor and again, they produce conflicting results because they can, in some, some studies show that anaesthetic ablates hip origin pain, and some studies have shown that anaesthetic doesn't always do it. So if you give anaesthetic and it ablates the pain, well, that's good. But if it doesn't ablate it, you've got to be wary that sometimes it won't always work. And then, obviously, in recent years, there's been uh, other inject dates proposed, such as uh, uh, artificial joint fluid and PRP. So when you're performing hip intervention, you obviously need consent, and it depends on your uh, medical system, whether it's verbal or written. Uh, luckily in the UK, we can get away with verbal consent, which aids speed of doing a number of procedures. The main risk you need to warn them about is uh, infection, uh, and it's low, but it's the main risk you obviously need to worry about because of septic arthritis. And the equipment you use will depend on what type of procedure you're performing and how you're performing it, as I'll show you. So traditionally, as radiologists, we're all trained to do this fluoroscopically, going centrally down onto the uh, femoral head neck junction, as you can see here. When I'm performing it fluoroscopically, I prefer to go uh, between the truck, and ten tr truck anters, as you can see here, because it allows you to have your hand out of the beam and you can live uh, direct where you want to go if that's the case. But again, most times you're just aiming for the central uh, femoral neck. But the important principle for this and any intervention where you're using image guidance uh, is that you want to see as you inject no resistance and that the contrast flows away beautifully from the needle and doesn't collect around it. So where you see contrast collecting around your needle, you've got to think immediately you're not in the right place. So again, traditionally, ultrasound came along and everybody thought, this is great, we'll just do it the same way. We'll look at this longitudinal uh, image of the femoral neck and we'll direct the needle along that area. But in fact, that's actually quite difficult. That's quite a long distance. You usually need a, a long needle to do it and it can be difficult to get a good position. So what we perform in Leeds now and many other areas also do it is to go in short axis. This gives you much better visibility of the needle usually means that you can get away with a 5 centimeter needle, uh, usually a 20 gauge needle into the joint itself, which is much more conspicuous on your ultrasound and doesn't uh, have the kind of flexibility that spinal needles can mean that if muscles contract, especially in athletes, uh, means it misses the point. So here's an example. This is the femoral head in short axis. We have iliosaurus sitting here. This is the needle coming in. and. As I inject, you can see again that principle, you can see it flowing away in the head. So air is actually quite helpful in ultrasound. Obviously, if you're doing an MR arthrogram, we don't want a lot of air, but any, anywhere else you can see it. So what about periarticular uh, 
problems we've already heard about uh, labral tears, degenerative change, and also uh, psoas tendon. You can see uh, psoas, uh, you can see here a labral cyst on ultrasound, which again, if you wish, you can direct an injection into. Alternatively, an intraarticular injection will probably just do the same. Iliopsoas, we've already heard about it, so I'll not mention, but again, the principle for accessing the iliopsoas tendon is the same for accessing the joint. So you scan in short axis, as you can see here, this is the femoral head again, you can see the cartilage in the joint, and here's the iliopsoas tendon, overlying muscle with it. And if there's no bursa, if it's a snapping tendon, quite often there isn't a bursa associated. You just see the abnormal movement clinically. And also you can sometimes see it on ultrasound itself, although it can be technically difficult because the probe gets in the way. And again, to slide your needle in from that transverse position and inject steroid around the iliopsoas tendon itself. Another common cause of uh, hip pain or hip region pain is greater trochanteric pain syndrome. And again, the options for this uh, include all the way from uh, rehab to surgery and injections certainly in a non-athletic uh, group uh, form an important part of treatment. But again, the evidence is just the same. Steroids are shown to be uh, a good painkiller. Uh, where do you inject and do you even need image guidance and this is one area where I would argue you certainly probably don't need uh, certainly probably isn't probably a good way to put it you probably don't need uh, image guidance so what's the evidence well these two uh, large reviews have shown that in fact people do get better with injections uh, and they're more likely to uh, they're more likely to do this if they have a short duration of symptoms so those with chronic symptoms or have underlying arthropathy are less likely to do well. Uh, this is one study where they compared injection and normal treatment and again showed that injection produced better pain benefit at 12 weeks but at one year no difference. But again normal treatment was a very uh, loose term and differed for a lot, lot number of people. This is an interesting study and it's one of the few uh, comparators where they did a blind injection and interestingly, because it was an American study, I suspect, at that time, they didn't use ultrasound, they did fluoroscopic injection, and they showed that there was no difference between this. And then this other study looking at shockwave treatment, again, showed that steroid was better at 6 to 12 weeks in terms of pain relief, but at one year, in fact, shockwave treatment was better. So where should you inject? Well, these studies that, in fact, showed that Blind injections were just as good. Maybe shows that it doesn't really matter where you inject. There's one small uh, study, which again has a, a number of uh, limitations to it. Uh, the biggest being that they only followed the patients for 14 days. Uh, they showed that the patients that they injected the greater trochanter bursa did better than the subluteus medius bursa. So where are these bursae? Well, if we look at, again, the short axis of the femoral head, neck, and trochanteric region, we have the subluteus minimus, medius, and the trochanteric bursa goes around it. So if you're scanning the patient in short axis, you've got the minimus, medius, medius muscle, maximus muscle, and in between we've got the tra greater trochanter bursa. So if you want to inject that area, we can either come in from the back into the bursa. If you want to inject medius, you just accelerate it in, or you can come from the front. So here's somebody with a uh, trochanteric bursa, and this is the injection. So we're coming in from the front, and initially, again, this shows this principle. As I inject, you'll see that the, contra the uh, injectate co collects around the needle, so I'm not in the right place. So I need to stop, get a better view of my tip, and advance it, and then you start to see it filling out the bursa fully. So always stop. If you, see the, if you see the injector collecting around the tip. So let's leave the hip now and move on to the groin. Uh, and uh, we've already heard the number of conditions that can occur. And certainly in my clinical practice, the two clinical diagnoses I get sent are people who think uh, it's sympathetic adductors, as we've talked about this morning, and this, this other group um, that think it's uh, inguinal-based pain uh, pre preclinical hernias, whatever you want to call it. And we've already discussed this, so I'll not go uh, into it in detail about the terminology. It's confusing. Uh, it's just confusing in the radiology literature as it is in the uh, examination and clinical literature. Uh, 
And again, uh, as, as Sonia showed this morning, the majority of studies, uh, certainly in soccer players, show that the clinical findings are usually adductor related. So, again, Sonia this, this morning presented um, the kind of five areas uh, that you can evaluate and certainly from a symptomatic and pathology point of view I see two main patterns in uh, professional soccer players and it's those that predominantly have that florid uh, bone marrow edema as Ara showed and then there's this area that we've discussed this morning already this kind of junctional area where the adductors rectus abdominis the fibro the capsule the fibrocartilage and the bone kind of all meet and again, I, I think that the cleft is just an example of that injury process. So the pubic bone marrow edema, the florid edema, as you can see here, that Ara showed this morning, where both bo uh, pubic bodies have florid edema. There's kind of a halo of edema around them almost, but there's no actual tissue disruption. That capsular junction where the adductors rectus abdominis all meet isn't actually disrupted. And this is the less frequent pattern that I see, and usually it's in younger soccer players. So when I say younger, it's usually in 16, 17 year olds. And again, as Ara said this morning, what causes it? I'm not sure. I've seen some players go on to develop stress fractures of the sacrum that have this pattern. So whether it's like a stress injury through here, but we could say that for all the injuries uh, that we see. Um, and again, uh, because it's younger players, you can perform injections in this area to give pain relief, but usually there isn't a, a, a push from the club to do that because the player usually isn't a first team player and they would rather rest them and treat them conservatively or non-injection rather. And again, uh, this is from the study we just published uh, in BJSM and uh, we had 34 players that we followed over four years and this is an example, this is somebody who's never had groin pain and didn't have groin pain during the five years and you can see there's florid edema here, there's remodelling, there's all this uh, what, what people would call degenerative change but this is an 18 year old soccer player. So the cleft that was described by Steve Eustace's group uh, in a number of papers in the mid-2000s in AJR and radiology was this cleft, and they called it a cleft because they injected the symphysis pubis and, sh and saw that uh, the dye leaked out, and they called it the secondary cleft. And, uh, and I think it is, a, it is a disruption of that capsule where the adductors rectus abdominis, the capsule meets with the underlying fibre cartilage of the joint and the bone marrow. And we see that in other sequences. It's described classically in the coronal sequence in these papers, but we also see it in the axial sequences or oblique axial. And again, you can see on the right, we've got thickening. Uh, we've got uh, the rectus abdominis, the ductor, the capsule. You've got the uh, old apophysis of the right pubis, which is all low signal. And then on the left, you can see we've got this fluid <coughs> undercutting all this area, uh, implying partial disruption. So clefts can be seen uh, in symptomatic players. And again, as Sonia highlighted really well this morning, a number of these studies were flawed in so much as they have, didn't have control groups or they had control groups that weren't really relevant to uh, soccer. You know, for example, a lot of Steve Eustace's uh, studies had uh, a control group of rowers, so it's probably not surprising that we didn't see clefts in those. And more and more of the literature since then has shown that the clefts do occur in asymptomatic people. So this is another pattern that we see. Oops, sorry. Uh, you kind of see uh, this low-grade edema within the bone and some within the capsular structure. And again, you could almost call that normal. There's that thickening and remodeling at the back, which we see all the time. And again, I don't think it has any significance. And this player had left-sided pain. And you can see that there's more focal and intense edema. Again, at the junction, really, the Dr. Longus has come off. This is more brevis and gracilis. And this junction with the bone, again, shows high signal. Here's a number, uh, here's an example of this uh, asymptomatic cleft. This person was sent, or this player was sent along because they had ham hamstring origin pain on the left. And you can see quite nicely the cleft here. And on the coronal, again, you can see this cleft. And again, as I said this morning, uh, before the coffee, it's probably not surprising because in every other aspect of imaging, we see persistent abnormality, certainly in athletes who've had muscle tears, tendon tears, shoulder problems, labral problems in the hip. They just don't go back to looking normal. So it's probably not unsurprising that it's going to be the same in the groin 
Another area you can get ca caught out with, certainly uh, in post-treatment, people with recurrent groin pain, is that uh, depending, you have to know what surgery was performed. And again, we've already mentioned that there's a number of surgical procedures described, and this patient's had one. This is an adductor tenotomy release on the right. So in fact, this has been produced surgically, and this is myopathic change in the muscle. So in fact, this, none of this is acute, and uh, you'd be hard pushed to kind of differentiate that from an acute injury if you didn't know. So really, the principle for looking at people with recurrent groin pain is you're looking for those severer uh, findings. You're looking for the severer terms of bone marrow edema, the severer uh, forms of soft tissue edema, and it's incredibly subjective. So we've already seen this morning that we can find milder features in a lot of athletes. So really, you've really got to go for the severer findings are going to be more significant. But ultimately, it comes down to what Ara said uh, in that clinical, exam clinical correlation is the most important feature. So you can report things all day, and if you're divorced from the clinical picture, you're going to make so many mistakes. And we found that especially with FAI. People get really excited about FAI and start reporting bumps all over the place. Look at x-rays, you'll see them all the time. All our registrars started reporting it. GPs are writing back to us saying, what is FAI? And you just create a big problem. So the fact of the matter is, this player was having imaging for something else. So we know he's asymptomatic, so we know that isn't a, a problem. So the biggest problem for me personally uh, is the inguinal-based uh, diseases that are processes that are described. And again, there have been multiple areas described, uh, including micro tears and so on. And really, from an imaging point of view, I find it really uh, difficult. John may show something different after this, but certainly I find ultrasound and MRI isn't really helpful in assessing the inguinal <coughs> tissues for abnormality. So all these tears that are described um, I can't see them on imaging. And imaging is pretty good elsewhere. We can see almost too much detail in a lot of cases, but usually the inguinal canal looks normal in these athletes. Uh, and are we talking about a different process or a clinical interpretation, a different clinical interpretation of the same process? So I would say from the point of view of MRI imaging or any imaging, if you're looking at the symphysis pubis, that the spurring, the irregularity, and I always, I must admit, I always think disc extrusion, um, but Sonia has contradicted me this morning in her, from her study, um, is something that we see so commonly in uh, any athlete, and it's just a sign of athletic activity over the years and degenerative change. If it's a purely inguinal canal diagnosis and they're confident, I don't know if there's any much point in really doing imaging, um, because certainly finding positive uh, features is really difficult. Uh, really, the things that I find most useful are bone marrow edema and then this kind of edema or disruption at this junction where the adductors, the rectus abdominis, the capsule meet and can form this cleft, if you want to call it. The problem is we're seeing more and more uh, prevalence of this finding in asymptomatic athletes. And really, you've got to go with clinical correlation and also uh, go with uh, the severity of findings. So as I've said, an athlete with groin pain, I would usually go straight to MRI. Uh, we rarely perform x-rays, rarely perform flamingo views. Sometimes they have been performed, but most uh, elite players go straight to MRI. Uh, imaging as a predictor, well, I've just said we can see it in asymptomatic people. There have been a number of studies showing that severe findings correlate well with symptoms, but again, uh, a lot of those studies were ultimately flawed, as you've seen from this morning. And from imaging as a predictor for who needs an injection and who needs surgery, again, I don't think we can use imaging as that predictor. I think it's, it's clinical correlation, as I'll show you. So if we're talking about injecting the symphysis pubis, there's a number, there are a number of studies out there, and uh, two of them by Ernest Childers, who's in the audience. Uh, and the first paper in 2007 looked at professional soccer players, and they found that... Um, the group with the uh, negative MRI, and the, but also with the lower clinical severity, uh, were more likely to do well with injection than those that had a positive MRI, but also were clinically more uh, severe. So really, are we sure it's the MRI that's positive that's the predictor, or is it the clinical findings? And I suspect it's more the clinical findings. Uh, and uh, again, in the asymptomatic, sorry, not in the asymptomatic, in non-professional 
uh, athletes, again, there was no predictor. Most people got better with an injection. Uh, O'Connell, with the paper where they described the secondary cleft, uh, all their players got better um, after the injection immediately, but they didn't really have a long-term follow-up. Uh, and, of course, they had anaesthetic in their inject date, so um, it's difficult to work out uh, what happened there. And then the original paper that we all uh, quoted uh, for a long time, uh, from 1995, only really describes eight cases. So, again, as with everything else, the uh, evidence is quite limited. So how do you do it? Well, you can do it uh, fluoroscopically, but I'm going to show you how we do it uh, under ultrasound guidance. So first of all, you get the patient uh, pro, uh, supine. Uh, I start at the scan longitudinally uh, over the symphysis pubis and then introduce the needle from above and into the joint. So you end up with your needle coming in, into here, and there's usually a crunch and a bit of pain for the pay player. And again, you can see that trickling away. Oops, don't know what's happened there. <laughs> Didn't like that. <laughs> there we go, it's come back. Whoa, it's all gone pear-shaped. Luckily, luckily, I'm near the end, so we're all right. Uh, let's go. Yeah. So, again, you see the injectate flowing away from your needle. And this is a different player. And what we find, and, and what uh, uh, the paper by Brennan showed as well, is that quite often you, you obviously see the contrast flowing along the cleft. And quite often a player will feel the bubbles uh, going into the groin. It's quite an unusual uh, feeling. And it's usually on the side where you've seen the cleft. So this is a, a different patient, but we've now gone transverse. So this is the needle here. This is the needle tip coming out at you. And you'll see, as I finish the injection, the cleft was on this side. Now, you're going to say, oh, look at all the irregularity there, but there's equal irregularity over there. You just can't see. And you'll see the air from the injection just filling it. There it goes. So that isn't another needle. That's actually air shooting down the secondary cleft. We used to do uh, more injections where we targeted um, uh, examples such as this. You can see here there's thickening on both sides, but there's some edema here. And we used to introduce a needle uh, through the skin, just lateral to the superficial ring and into this area here and perform dry needling. Again, there's no real evidence, but you can do it if you wish. And here we are, dry needling. Again, so here's the pubic bone. This is the junctional tissue where we've seen the edema up here. And again, whether that uh, produces uh, a long-term relief or has a predictive value, nobody really knows. All we know is that a lot of players do get better with it and then they undergo rehabilitation. Now, whether it's the rehabilitation that's the real factor, I'm not sure. So what about inguinal injections? So again, we've had all these conditions described. Is anybody doing inguinal canal injections? Well, the answer is yes, but there's no real uh, literature on it at all. Uh, if you look in the anaesthetic lit literature, they describe, as you can see here, the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerve as, uh, as it goes off into the inguinal canal itself. And you can also get the inguinal canal as it is here. This is psoas. This is the inguinal canal in short axis. And uh, you can introduce the needle into there and inject away. But again, there's no proof that that really uh, produces any uh, benefit uh, in terms of... Uh, obviating the need for surgery. So in conclusion, there's a wide variety of intervention possible, but as you've already heard this morning, uh, the literature to support that, as it is uh, elsewhere in the body, not just the groin, uh, isn't, isn't that good. Um, you really usually end up tailoring the procedure to the individual patient. It depends on the severity. It depends what they, what they want to try, as opposed to going for further rehab or for surgery. And obviously we need more studies to evaluate the efficacy, both of steroid and these other uh, substances that are now coming along, such as PRP. Thank you.